and gentlemen. Uh, Can I please have your attention? Dear listeners, this is Jonah Goldberg, host of the Remnant Podcast, brought to you by the Dispatch and Dispatch Media. Don't adjust the audio. I'm just speaking in one of these annoying uh, quasi-fake whispers that so many podcast and NPR hosts use now. I'm not saying all the hosts are annoying. I'm just saying the voice is annoying. I guess it it's because it... it, it it encourages people to lean in and listen. And it sort of like forces you to do more active listening. That's, that's at least my theory. My, uh, my previous theory was just that Michael Barbaro, the host of The Daily, simply recorded most podcasts while struggling on the toilet. Um, but the reason I'm whispering now, and I'm going to stop this fake whispering, the reason why I'm being a little lower key, lower volume, is that it is... Um, Barely five. It's not quite yet five o'clock in the morning. Um, I'm in Portland, Oregon, and I don't know how thin these walls are for my neighbors, so I don't want to do my normal projecting. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm in Oregon. I'll, I don't know how secret I need to keep this, but I'm I'm here for for personal stuff. It's all good. Um, I'm excited to talk about it, um, but I gotta talk to my wife about it first. Um, but I'm not here for work or anything. Um, although I. I spent most of the day just doing nothing but work. We kind of had a logistical screw up where, you know, as you may recall, my wife drove my daughter out to college in Southern California, and then we had to be in Portland. So she flew up from Southern California. I flew out from the from Washington, D.C. And when we were planning this, she was like, well, you know, you shouldn't just, just like turn around and go home the next day. Um, so, um you know, why don't we stay till Friday? So I booked my flight till Friday. She forgot she said this and booked her return on Thursday and I couldn't get a good flight or a good seat back yesterday. So I spent the day alone in Portland uh, working and um, and walking around. I walked, oh, uh, I'm going to write about this for the G-File today. So it's, it's a weird G-File setup um, coming your way. Um but I walked around a lot. I'm a big city walker. I like walking around cities. Um, but I got to say, and I'm going to write about it again, um, Portland makes me sad. It is a tragic situation here. I have I have relatives out here who tell me, you know, some of who used to live in Portland, who have been telling me just how bad the decline of Portland has been. Um, and... It's amazing. I mean, again, I grew up in New York City in the 1970s and 1980s. I'm used to seeing homelessness. I'm used to sort of being able to carry myself in a way that, um, you know, that doesn't invite stupid risks and all that kind of thing. Um, but just the prevalence of, it's not, I mean, homelessness this is kind of the wrong word. I mean, this is one of my problems with home, with the term homelessness is it homogenizes the plights of very different people. The reasons why some people are on the street have to do with what you might call just straight up homelessness, which is sort of code for economic hardship, lack, lack of social capital and all that kind of thing. And then there are other people who are on the street because of a series of really bad choices that have less to do with like heart economic bad luck. And then there are other people on the street who are on the street because they are mentally unwell. I mean, seriously mentally handicapped in some way. And I don't use handicap in a pejorative sense. It's just obviously so there was a piece in the LA times recently saying that the single biggest policy disaster of the last quarter century, um, or 50 years, I can't remember the timeline was, um, that we released all of these mentally ill people um, onto the streets, you know, when we deinstitutionalized and we didn't give them any place to go and any support. And I agree with that. I'm also, um, I get very annoyed by these sorts of things because, did, we, did I talk about this with Pethokoukis? Maybe I did. Um, because there are things that conservatives have been saying for a very long time um, that 
if conservatives say them, liberals refuse to admit them um, or they delay admitting them. And, and the same goes the other way around, right? This is a problem with partisanship um, and tribal thinking that um, people are, that different tribes are unwilling to admit hard truths if the other tribe gets to take any satisfaction from it or gets to say, I told you so. And, um, yeah, we must have talked about this with Pethokoukos because we were talking about how, like, all of a sudden Ezra Klein realizes that um, the sort of no-growth, anti-growth politics and culture of the 1970s was bad for people, <laughs> bad for the country, um, and that maybe abundance and abundant energy is a good thing. Um, and so it is with, with the homelessness stuff. We've lost 60 years of public policy um, because of the very weird coalition between a certain strain of right-wing libertarian and, um, and left-wing progressive uh, in the 1970s who were in some ways very right. You know, look, I mean, some of those, those mental hospitals were terrible and they required um, a lot more money than they were getting. But so you had this weird coalition of um, sort of budget cutters, sort of mainstream Republican budget cutters, a really weird, I mean, truly weird strain of libertarianism, of a kind of libertarianism. There are lots of libertarians that weren't part of this, but it was a real thing. There's this guy, Thomas Zaz, I think that's how you pronounce his name, who insisted there really was no such thing as mental illness and you should judge people by their be. You know, but whether if they don't commit obvious crimes or something, then you should let them live their lives. And um, the Scientologists were s slightly into this stuff. And um, there were lots of really horrible and grotesque analogies between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. You know, they put political prisoners in mental institutions and therefore the people in our mental institutions are political prisoners, too. And apparently the crime that they were committing was thinking differently than sort of you know, contemporary society. It was all nonsense. We left a lot of people to suffer. Uh, when I was growing up in, on the Upper West Side in the 1970s, every spring, it was like, you know, the, the swallows going to Capistrano, the, the, these Thorzine addicted, these Thorzine addled, uh, very mentally ill people were all released from various hospitals up in the Bronx and in upper Manhattan, and they would just start migrating down. And, um, and anyway, it was, it, it's a good lesson about how when on some public policy issues, when you have actual bipartisanship, that's when you really need to watch your wallet because there's some group think going on. And, um, Anyway, we can talk more about this. I want to get a homeless guy, not a home, and not a person without a home, and a homelessness expert back on the show. It's been too long since we did a show on homelessness. Um, but anyway, part of my problem, how to get on? Oh, so like part of my problem with the word homelessness is that it sanitizes and, um, and, and obscures a lot of different categories of people. And, um, this is something I really noticed um, when I first started coming out to the Pacific Northwest in the late 90s. The culture and the demographics of street people, um, for you know, for want of a better catch-all, um, is really different out here. Where I grew up, you know, homeless people, they certainly weren't all black, but they were disproportionately black. They were also disproportionately older, and they were disproportionately mentally ill in the, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I guess San Francisco doesn't technically count as the Pacific Northwest, but I included in there those cities, um, all the way up to Vancouver, well, just a lot more able-bodied young white men with a completely different attitude towards panhandling towards, um, their right to be out on the street, um, towards their right to barge into, restaurants and stores and use bathrooms and that kind of thing. Just a very different vibe to them. Um, anyway, I'm going to write more about it, but the, but Portland is just, 
it really has kind of an escape from New York kind of feel to it. You, you, you walk around and there is this sense that the, the people in the tents on the street, and I'm in, I'm in what is supposed to be a pretty good part of downtown. Um, I'm near all the stuff. It's a nice enough sort of boutique hotel. For those of you who know Portland, I'm in the high low and it's an autograph hotel, you know, one of those Marriott Bonvoy autograph hotels. So it's not, you know, it's not the Four Seasons or anything, but it's a perfectly nice place. It's got a trendy little hipster restaurant. Um, and the area around here is creepy. I would feel very uncomfortable having my wife walk around here alone at night. And when I say at night, I don't mean at two in the morning. I mean like at nine o'clock at night. There are little encampments all over the place. There are, um, you know, the, the people in the tents on the street look at you like you're looking in their living room window because this is their home and it's just, it's sad, it's depressing, it's off-putting and it didn't need to be this way. And this is sort of my, one of my big, I, I, I honestly find it kind of mysterious how uh, there hasn't been a left-wing Rudy Giuliani, um, somebody who says all the right stuff about LBGTQI and climate change and all that kind of stuff but says, hey, look, you cannot take a dump in the street. You cannot, um, you know, these tent cities are, 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 are bad for the city. Having drug addicts live in playgrounds is bad for the city. Um, it's bad for progressivism. It's bad for all the stuff that we want to say about how to live in a, in a progressive um, society. The, the turning of sort of street life into um, a sort of, uh, militant civil rights thing with the Antifa types being the sort of the, you know, the, the military wing of all of it is, um, is contrary to, you know, liberal principles, to progressive principles. It just doesn't make any sense. And, you know, part of the problem, the inherent failure, how to put this, speaking really, really, really broadly, right? The big problem with with conservatives is they're too quick to say no. And, um, and the big problem with progressives is they're too afraid to say no. And so sometimes conservatives say no to positive good things. They don't like, um, you know, sudden change and all that kind of stuff. And this is one of the reasons why I'm a conservative. I plead guilty to this natural sort of conservative temperament bias. Um, and part of the problem with progressives is the only people that, they feel comfortable saying no to are conservatives. And if you can turn something into a sort of uh, have versus have nots, social justice, civil rights, you know, we're the victims of society argument, then progressives are just simply going to lose, um, actually not all of them obviously, but like the San Francisco City Council or the Portland City Council, those kinds of things they lose their critical faculties and they become, it's very difficult for them to say, to make, to make hard calls that, you know, hurt people's feelings. And, um, um, and so Portland didn't need to be like this. I mean, I, I, Seattle's really bad these days too. I, although I haven't been there in about a year and a half, but like I was stunned about how much Seattle seems to be suffering. I, uh, part of that though was still the tail end of COVID. So I just don't want to, Judge, COVID's over here. I mean, you don't see a lot of people in masks. This is just, although <laughs> I'm near a couple of strip clubs and I'm sure it's an outdated sign, but one of the clubs has this whole thing about how this had this old sign up about how, you know, the fully nude strippers um, observe all uh, COVID protocols, social distancing, wearing masks. I think it's pretty funny. Anyway, um, so I was in... This place, Rich's uh, Cigar Store in Portland. Nice place, nice guys. I understand why they don't have a public bathroom, but that's a little annoying if you're going to set up and work there for the day. Um, and um, so I was set up there and working, typing, putting letters on a screen. And um, this older guy, um, an older than me, big bushy beard, didn't quite look homeless, but didn't look um, altogether not homeless. He, I saw out of the corner of my eye, he bought some stuff from the counter, and then he came over and sat down on this, you know, couch in front of me. 
I said, I nodded high and that was about it. And I had my headphones in and he sat there and he didn't smoke anything. And he sat there so long, sometimes with his eyes closed, uh, that one of the, one of the guys who worked at the cigar shop came up, um, and said, you know, can I help you? Cause I guess he didn't see that the guy had already bought anything. And, um, um, and the guy said, I, I, I already paid, I already paid. And, you know, he was like, he could tell that this guy wanted to kick him out. Um, and he did have that sort of squatter at Starbucks kind of vibe, but the guy, you know, said, okay, you know, let him sit there. And then he called over, he called this older guy back, this older proprietor of the store back and said, could you roll, um, a cigarette for me. He had bought uh, cigarette papers and some cigarette tobacco to roll his own cigarettes. And he started to tell, you know, I think it was a true sad story about how he's disabled. His hands are too arthritic. Um, and um, he couldn't do it himself. And the guy said, I can't do it. I got arthritis too. I'm sorry. And I was going to offer to do it. But then a minute later, he, um, asked me to do it. And I said, sure. You know, and I said, it's been a long time since I rolled anything in cigarette paper. Um, but I'll give it a whirl. So I, cause he couldn't open his pack and all that. So I opened it up and I put the tobacco in and, um, I rolled it. It wasn't a great job, but he didn't seem to care. He was grateful and, um, I was sort of happy to do it and, um, gave it to him. And, um, um, he starts to light the thing and the one of the guys who works at the cigar shop comes over and says you cannot smoke that in here and I felt terrible like it's weird and in DC there's a real bias um, at my cigar shop against people who smoke cigarettes but if you're a regular and you want to smoke a cigarette you probably can um, but the, it's weird cigar, cigar shops are fine with pipes are fine with cigars but the um, uh, cigarettes are pretty well frowned upon, but it's even worse here. Um, because like the owners of the place said, look, it's not us in the state of Oregon. It is illegal to smoke a cigarette indoors in any establishment. I can't tell you how stupid I think this is. This cigar shop was thick with cigar and pipe smoke. Right. And this guy, I felt really bad for him. I mean, I, I believe the owners were right. I think that I'm sure, I'm sure that they're right. Um, I felt bad that I'd set him up to do this. I didn't realize that like this guy would have been able to smoke a cigarette in my cigar shop. And I just sort of assumed it was the same. And this guy took offense at it because he believed, he didn't believe them that this was a state thing. And he was a little confused, but like the idea that cigarettes are, this, you know, unique talismanic evil um, in a state <laughs> that is chock-a-block with cannabis stores and that is so bad that even though you can have a grandfather exception for smoking pipes and cigars in a cigar shop, you cannot allow people to smoke cigarettes. I mean, it's just so stupid and so obvious. It's such an obvious sign of these sort of cultural non-scientific biases against cigarettes. It's sort of like, I mean, this is how I feel about the vaping stuff. I get, you know, you want to keep kids in high school from picking up vaping as a habit. That's fine. Um, but this, you know, hysteria about vaping is bad public policy. I mean, it's just bad. You know, like vaping extended my mom's life by a decade or two. You know, there's a reason why the National Health Service in the UK is very much behind vaping because vaping is like the one thing that is proven um, to get uh, large number numbers of cigarette smokers off of cigarettes. And what I found amazing about this is like, yeah, again, I, I, I think it was getting out of hand with the flavored stuff and, and marketing towards kids. That's fine. But cigarettes aren't marketed towards kids either. Um, uh, but like, it's just a sign of how the, the, the mere appearance of smoking is so offensive um, to some people. 
And, you know, cigarettes are deadly and dangerous because you inhale them. But what you, the, what you, in, what's dangerous about them is that the stuff that you inhale is smoke and the stuff that's in the smoke. Vaping is not that. And in every other realm of public policy, you know, similar public policy, the emphasis is on harm reduction. You know, this is why they're giving out needles at needle parts. And this is why they're giving out condoms and, you know, and all that. This is why we're supposed to have Narcan everywhere. There are good and bad arguments about all of that stuff. That's not my point. But like when it comes to vaping, because of this special stigma um, of cigarettes, uh, all that goes out. The harm reduction thing just goes out the window. Anyway. All right. So anyway, I felt bad for the guy. Um, and just know that even if you find a really great cigar shop in, in the state of Oregon, um, it, you can't smoke a cigarette inside, um, even if you bought it there. I mean, again, the guy bought the stuff there. So I've, I've, I've been very selective in my news consumption for the last day or two because I've been pretty busy. Um, but <sighs> all right, let's talk about Davos for a second. Like, I don't, know. I, I, I don't get why all of a sudden I'm supposed to have a strong opinion about Davos. I was on Twitter the other day and Lauren Boebert tweeted, I shall never speak at Davos. And <laughs> I responded to her. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure Davos accepts your terms and, um, you know, like, who cares? I mean, it is not the height of bravery to proclaim that you won't fly to Switzerland um, and uh, stay at really expensive hotels and eat, you know, really clever ways to melt cheese um, uh, and give a dumb thumb sucking talk someplace. And I've never been to the World Economic Forum. I think that's the formal name of it. Uh, my friend Jay Nordlinger goes and he would write these, you know. Uh, you know, dispatches from Davos stuff, which I thought were good, you know, and interesting. You know, you talk to, inter there are interesting people at Davos. And and let me be clear, if I were invited and all expenses were paid, I'd be happy to go because I love Switzerland. And um, being paid to go to a really, stay in a really fancy hotel and eat nice meals and talk to smart, rich people and policymakers and stuff, you know, great, I'm down. What I have a problem with is this tendency among the evil globalists. Um, I shouldn't use the say evil globalists on this side because I actually mean the kind of the kind of people I don't like. Um, the sort of the John Kerry world um, who invest in this, you know, friggin' conference. You know, any conferences and confabs I've been to? They're just not. You know, um, they're not as like when you get behind the red rope. <laughs> I can just, let me just tell you. They're not as mysterious and all powerful as people want to make them. Um, but anyway, like the, the, the attendees of Davos um, invest in it, this authority and seriousness that I think is completely undeserved. You know, I think part of it, it's sort of, well, some of you are probably too young or weren't paying attention at the time, but like, you know, there was the, um, the Clintons were part of this thing called like Renaissance weekends. And then, um, David Horowitz and those guys created, was it Dark Ages or Restoration Weekend? And they both became sort of like franchise grift things. I, I stopped paying attention to them. But there are these people who invest enormous meaning and significance in sitting around tables and talking about how other people should live. And and I think Davos is probably the most, Davos is most it's probably among the worst about it and the best in class in terms of like the, 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 the high profile nature of the attendees. But just as those guys turn it into this pretentious self-important thing, the people who don't go turn it into this, you know, sinister cabal, like it's specter or the egg council that is, you know, running the world. And, you know, like, you know, they talk about, you know, the, what was it that um Michael Anton Call them, which is a good word. It's a good, it's a good line, um, even though it was an idiotic and, and fundamentally evil piece in that Flight 93 thing, you know, like the Davoisie, right? Um, and basically, anybody who isn't isn't a paranoid populist and 
has more of a sort of shoulder shrug towards Davos than a sort of, you know, we must tear it down attitude towards it um, is, you know, part of the uh, sellout conservative class or whatever. And it's just all such fakery, you know, and it's, it's amazing, you know, how this kind of thing happens in every generation. I mean, in, in years past, it was the trilateral commission or the council on foreign relations or the attendees of Bohemian Grove who were putting chemicals in your water and making you like flan. I don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I know I've talked about this before. One of my biggest lessons of a quarter century of in this or more in this business in one way or the other is to discover that nobody knows what they're doing. And when I say that, I don't mean it like hyper literally. I just mean that like nobody's really running everything. Um, um, you know, I, I know I've talked about this before. The, when I went to the, uh, one of the times when I went to the, that big, Coke Brothers Donor Conference, which is a good conference, you know, um, and I was glad to go. You know, they paid me to give a speech. It went over well. This was back when I was in good odor in that world. But this was, I guess, 2012. And, you know, I go. And at this time, the New York Times and the New Yorker and a bunch of other mainstream media outlets were in hyper paranoia mode about the Koch Brothers and how evil they were and how they were controlling the country and they're controlling the conservative movement. And they were going to, um, you know force you to use, uh, you know, fossil fuels for the rest of our lives. And they, they hated the planet and all this, you know, all that stuff. And, um, um, and you know, that they were pulling all of the strings and they completely owned the Republican party and yada, 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 yada. I get there. And during the, you know, the first plenary session where, you know, all the attendees are in one room, the entire theme of the thing, you know, is about how, these people, these incredibly rich people, have been frozen out of the party, frozen out of the process. The political consultants run everything. If we could just get around the political consultants, we know what to do, yada, yada, yada. And I can just tell you, like, because I know some political consultants, the political consultants are like, oh, man, if we could just keep the donors out of our hair and do what we do best, everything would be fine. And you go around every time you find, every time someone identifies the people who are really running things, who are really pulling the strings, if you go to them, they think someone else is. You know, there's no, you know, like, I think you've all made this point on the second or third episode of The Remnant. You know, it's like when you're in the White House, you announce this big policy, you have all these strategy meetings, and you go live with it, right? You throw it out there into the world, and then you wait for a few days to see whether it's going to be a dud, whether it falls on its face, whether somebody takes the idea and does something completely different with it. That's how government works. That's how life works at, 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 the, at these levels. And um, to imbue Davos or World Economic Forum um, with this, you know, outsized sense of control of our lives is, is, is really kind of naive and weird. Now, the problem is, it's like a lot of these things. It's like, you know, I, I often say that the problem with the Democratic Party is they think that if everybody voted, if they could just turn out everybody in this country to vote, they would win every ele election by a landslide. And the problem with the Republican Party is they think it too. <laughs> um, and so you get Democrats trying to boost turnout and make people terrified of, of voter suppression in ways that are kind of paranoid and ridiculous. And you have Republicans actually trying to <laughs> sort of uh, limit access to the ballot and the ballot box and um, all that because they actually think it too. And both are wrong. Like the political science on this is pretty settled that if every single person in America voted, it would not be obviously to either nece obviously or necessarily to either party's advantage. That whole this whole turnout thing is a relative concept. But anyway, we don't. Uh, we have a, a million years to talk about all that. The problem with the sort of Davos stuff is that, and it's not just. I should say it's not just on the right. The the sort of inflation paranoia about Davos. There are a lot of sort of serious lefties who hate it as a neoliberal um, string pulling organization too, right? Um, but the problem is, is that the 
the Davos haters all think it is this all powerful manipulator of global opinion of global policy making, you know, that the 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 globalists convene um to, you know, run our lives in in Switzerland every year. And the problem is, is that a lot of the attendees think that too. They're just wrong. <laughs> and like, so there's this clip of John Kerry, who I want to be very clear. I do not like John Kerry. I do not like John Kerry at all. People still think it's because of partisan stuff. Um, that is just simply not the case. There's a, there, I think it's Dave Barry has written a bunch about this. John Kerry is just a bad guy. There are all of these stories about how like at, you know, ski resorts and scuba places and this place and that place, he cuts lines. He just walks straight up to the counter, even if there's a long line and demands attention right away. And when people say, sir, there's a line, he says, do you know who I am? And I hate that kind of thing. I hate it from the left. I hate it from the right. It has nothing to do with politics. I think of that like line cutting. Unless you have a legitimate emergency, you know, and that does happen. Like if your plane's about to take off and you say, uh, and you apologize for it and say, I'm sorry, I got to, you know, do this or whatever. Or like, you know, your kid's bleeding and you're at the ER and you run to the counter. I get it. There are, you know, there are like exceptions to this rule. But if you're a line cutter out of just sort of arrogance, I, I, there's something in me that feels like that is like the single most un-American <laughs> evil thing. I just, I hate it. Right. And he's a jerk like that. And um, and it doesn't help that he also looks like he's turning into Odo from Deep Space Nine. But um, um, and I'll just be bipartisan about this. One of my favorite stories. I think it's safe to tell the story now um, uh, about because they're like jerk bosses. Or they're jerk bosses everywhere. But like jerk boss stories in Washington are, are um, a great uh, social lubricant. Um Years ago, Alan Keyes, when he was at National Empowerment Television, got into the elevator with an intern. The intern moved to the back of the elevator, you know, on the far, on the diagonal side from where the elevator buttons were. And Keyes stood right by the elevator buttons. And then Keyes turned around and said to this kid, that button's not going to press itself. Um because he thought he was too good to actually press the L, the lobby button, whatever. I, I, I find that kind of pretentiousness um, and self-regard lo so loathsome. And um, but anyway, so there's this clip, uh, you'll find it, of Kerry talking about how fantastic it is that he can sit in a room with a handful of people and save the planet. Um, he says it's like it's almost extraterrestrial, you know, and he's just marveling at how awesome and important he and the people he sits with are for making decisions for the whole planet. And yeah, they, look, they can make decisions that have real political impact in ways that I can't and you most of you can't um, make decisions that have impact. But um, they're not freaking saving the planet. They're not like running things. It's not a star chamber. But when you say stuff like that, when there is a climate out there that believes that they are, it is just so grotesquely self-serving and unproductive um, and stupid. And it just, it just, you know, it was like, it makes me want to like join Steve Bannon and pitchforking these jackwads. Um, and it does remind me, um, I was going to write about, I, I, so the other day, uh, 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 remnant beloved uh, alumni uh, Jack Butler emailed me. It was funny. So like he emailed me asking if I wanted to write a, a letter to the editor. Response. This is how it works at a lot of newspapers and magazines now. Is is letters to the editor are often solicited, um, particularly if someone is like mentioned in the original piece. Uh, and uh, there's nothing wrong with it. It's like you know if you. Uh, if, if at commentary someone wrote something about me, Abe Greenwald might send me an email saying, hey, do you want to like respond to this in the letters? That kind of thing. So like that's how it works. And um, um, this is not to say that your unsolicited letters to the editor at the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times won't necessarily get published. I don't really know how the daily newspaper stuff necessarily works. I'm just talking about magazines. Anyway, so he um, he sent me an email asking if I wanted to uh, respond to this uh, book review essay 
um, in in National Review, you know, Jackson Muckety Muck editor at National Review now, um, that was a review of this book about fascism and the uses and abuses of fascism. And about three days later, he emailed me back and said, uh, just circling back on this, you haven't responded. And I told him, and it was absolutely true. I thought I had dreamed that email. <laughs> like I seriously thought I had a dream where Jack had asked me if I wanted to write a letter to the editor about fascism um, for National Review. And it turned out that it had actually happened. Um, I would really wish this was a story about Powerball instead. But um, so anyway, I, I read the piece. I thought it was fine. I thought it was, you know, uh, there's a lot I agreed with. I haven't read the underlying book that he's, this guy was reviewing. I can't remember the guy. It's just Trowdy. Apologies for not getting his name right of the reviewer. Um, I remember the name of the guy who wrote the book because I thought it was such a, it was one of these names that like you could see the, the sort of alt-right crazies making a big deal out of. It was like, it's cuck lick. Um, which, you know, for people who use the word cuck a lot, it just sort of, I thought it was funny. Anyway, um, and the reason why Jack asked if I wanted to respond to it is because in this book, uh, or in this review of the book about fascism, uh, the reviewer sort of name checks me as one of the examples of people who have sort of, he doesn't say it outright, but the, uh, this is the implication given the other things that he lists that I've abused or misused um, the word fascism um, or overused the word fascism or stretched it beyond its intent, blah, 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 blah. And um, not exactly a new accusation. So I wrote, you know, 250 words responding to it, saying that's not quite fair because, and this is absolutely, and I think that's, this is absolutely true. Um, the stuff that he was, the, the gist of his entire review was sort of this intellectual history of how, you know, fascism has become a slur and people use it this way and people use it that way. And here's this interesting history and, and no one and all these definitional doctrinal disputes about how to define fascism are all over the place. Like this is literally the first chapter of my book. Um, I went through all of this. I, I knew 90 percent of all of the, you know, the, the references and citations that he was talking about. You know, I mean, it's been a while since I delved deep into fascism stuff, but um and so it's a little unfair to sort of throw me in with all that when, you know, with Michelle Goldberg, No Relations, um, book about, you know, accusing evangelicals of being fascists and all that kind of stuff. That's that's not how I I did it. Um, or at least I, I took some serious pains to sort of define my terms and explain what I was talking about in ways that a lot of the, you know, Naomi Wolves and Chris Hedges didn't. Um, it didn't matter. I got accused of it no matter what. And I, you know, I get it. The title was a bloody shirt and all that. But anyway, I bring it up because uh, uh, in the context of the Davos thing, um, because, you know, the, the title of my book, Liberal Fascism, was, as is explained on, um, you know, page one, page two, something like that, maybe page three, if we're going, going to be real saucy, was a, uh, a reference to... Uh, H.G. Wells, who gave this speech to the young liberals in 1932 in Oxford, where he called for um, liberal fascism. I was recently rereading this piece, this academic piece, by this guy Philip Copeland. I think that's how you pronounce his name. It's C-O-U-P-L-A-N-D, called H.G. Wells' Liberal Fascism. And he wrote it in, in the year 2000. And uh, in the year 2000, um, looking at it, because I was going to reference that, I, I ended up not, but uh, the piece, you know, the, 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 the academic paper, um, which I'll just so you know, was in the Journal of Contemporary History in October of 2000. It's really, it's really interesting to me. And uh, let me back up. I'm sorry. I'm from frame because I'm trying to find something to read you. It's hard to explain why liberal fascism was called liberal fascism and uh, invoke H.G. Wells because people don't today have completely forgotten 
I'm sure I'm going to get an email from people who know this. Um, but, you know, as a general matter, people have just like completely forgotten how big a deal H.G. Wells was in the first third of the 20th century. He would write stuff that would be read as sermons around the world um, in various churches. Uh, when he would visit, when he visited FDR, it was, it got the kind of coverage you'd expect from like a papal visit. Um, vast numbers of the most important progressive sort of social engineer types, public intellectuals, all credited H.G. Wells as like the most influential writer um, of their, of their lives. Um, it, it just, it just, it, the enormity of his importance back then, it, it, it's almost can't be un, overstated. And uh, I, so I'm sorry for all this meandering. The, the reason why um, the, all this came to mind um, was that one of the other things that Wells called for, which liberal fascism was sort of, his liberal fascism speech was an extension of his earlier book, which he uh, wrote, I think, the, you know, the first time in like 1930 and then reissued in the later 30s or something like that, which was called The Open Conspiracy. And um, the open conspiracy stuff was really kind of like what John Kerry was alluding to. This idea that the elites need to separate out from the masses and start directing people's lives, creating institutions uh, to lift humanity out of nationalism, out of religion, um, all of this stuff. And the reason why, if memory serves, you call it the open conspiracy is that he wanted sort of it to be just very clear that this is what we're doing and we're not going to apologize for it. And eventually we'll have our own schools and do blah, 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 blah. And while obviously there are flaws to, to you know, the analogy today, you know, there is, there's a lot to um, the sort of attitude. There's a lot about the attitude of sort of the transnational elite globalists that actually fits the H.G. Wells, H.G. Wells's, the Wellsian, um, vision of uh, the open conspiracy. And, um, you know, maybe I'll write more about that later. But anyway, I just, in my own defense, I'm going to read you this extended passion from, from this guy, Copeland. And um, I will try to be clear where he's quoting from Wells himself. Previous uh, paragraph, he's talking about how there's this debate about whether Wells had fascist tendencies whether he was a racist and authoritarian or whether he was like this open-minded, you know, human liberationist type, blah, 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 blah. And then this paragraph begins, the next paragraph begins, the relationship between these two sides of Wellsism is well illustrated by the liberal fascism, quote unquote, which Wells called for in his address to the young liberals at their summer school in Oxford in July of 1932. The reason why he was there, Wells stressed, was to, quote, assist in a kind of Phoenix rebirth of liberalism, unquote. Central, this is his words, central to this reborn liberalism would be what Wells called a, quote, competent receiver, by which he meant, quote, a responsible organization able to guide and rule the new scale human community, unquote. The competent receiver was also well, was also Wells carefully explained, quote, flatly opposed to the norms of parliamentary democracy, being a special class of people, quote unquote, of the type anticipated in, quote, the guardians, the guardian of Plato's Republic. Um, and then, quote from Wells, concrete expression of the same idea included the fascisti, the Italian for fascists, in Italy, Wells believed. New paragraph. For the modern state, for the quote unquote modernized state to come into existence, Wells asserted, would require, quote, the will and, uh, and the ideas of public-minded, masterful people, unquote, formed, quote, into a militant organization, unquote, which would, quote, release the human community from the entanglements of the past, unquote. The alternative was for civilization to be left to, quote, stagger down past redemption to chaotic violence and decadence, unquote. Consequently, liberalism, while seeking, quote, one prosperous and progressive world community of just, kindly, free-spirited, freely thinking, and freely speaking human beings, unquote, in a world of, quote, unquote, gangsters, 
also required, quote, a voice and a backbone. Uh, Copeland then adds, one should add that this Wellesian liberal utopia, with its renunciation of parliamentary democracy, private property, and individualism, was not the good society as liberals in the conventional sense would have understood it. Thus, in order to seek this, quote-unquote, prosperous and progressive utopia, liberals had to move with the times, quote-unquote, discard what Wells called the sentimental casualness of 19th century liberalism, unquote, and transform themselves into a liberal fascisti. In so doing, liberalism would become an organization to, quote, replace the dilatory indecisiveness of parliamentary politics, unquote, in the same way that the, quote, fascist party to the best of its ability is Italy now, so, quote, the fascist of liberalism must carry out a parallel ambition on a still vaster scale, Wells declared. Okay, so that's sort of where I got this idea of liberal fascism, right? The, the concept that explains the title. And this idea of sweeping away 19th century parliamentary democracy, sweeping away 19th century Manchester liberalism, all that kind of stuff, I cannot exaggerate how ripe that idea was from about 1890 with Edward Bellamy's uh, Looking Backward science fiction book until World War II. It was the standard boilerplate rhetoric of Benito Mussolini, defenders of Benito Mussolini, of Bolsheviks, of, of, of Leninists, the Communist Party, various fascist parties, various nationalist parties, all of them, H.G. Wells used to say, you know, talk about the putrefying corpse of 19th century liberalism, blah, 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 blah. Um, Anne Moreau Lindbergh in a weird, nasty, strange, you know, sad little book called The Wave of the Future, which is where we get the term wave of the future, um, predicted that, you know, collectivism of, of the either the Nazi, the Bolshevik, or some combination of the two sort was coming down the pike and, and liberal democracies has just got to, you know, make peace with the ine inevitability of it. And um, I cannot tell you how much I hear echoes of that sort of thing from the sort of post-liberal right from the anti-climate, you know, the climate change hysterics on the left. You know, there are whole books written about how, uh, how, how Western-style democracy is simply in, no longer adequate to the challenge of, of climate change, and therefore we got to get rid of it. Um, this idea of, you know, constitutionalism and classical liberalism um, standing in the way of, of progressive change has been out there forever. And now it's being met on the right by, you know, the sort of similar kind of either a nationalist or post-liberal or Catholic idea of integralism and um, moving beyond the dilatory politics of, you know, of, of mere democracy kind of thing. People gussy it up. People put different lipstick on it. You know, and I'm not saying that everybody who doesn't like the, you know, the, the fusionist consensus of the last 30 years or 50 years. Um, is is a fascist or a totalitarian or anti-democracy and all that kind of stuff. But you can just see it, if you pay attention to the writings of these people, how quickly the logic of this kind of thing creeps in. Because, and this gets to my whole argument about the, the problem with new ideas, is that most of new ideas in the realm of politics and economics, I don't mean like, like look, I think there are all sorts of good and interesting ideas in um, you know, in behavioral, new ideas in behavioral economics and that kind of thing. I'm talking about like macro political economy, essentially political arguments masquerading as economic arguments. Um, that most of the new ideas and all that stuff are really about empowering the people proposing the ideas and the factions associated with it. It is a way to sort of short circuit having an argument on the old terms. Um, and, um, and saying, I don't need to deal with the best arguments of our critics um, because I'm talking about something completely new that my critics have never anticipated. And the problem with that is that most new ideas aren't new. This is why, you know, I like Albert J. Nock. This is why, you know, uh, you know, and for newer listeners, this podcast is called The Remnant. It's a reference to an Albert J. Nock essay 
called Isaiah's Job from the Atlantic in uh, 1936, I want to say. Um, and, you know, Knock at his best, and well, I, obviously I had my disagreements with Knock. You know, he would, he would say things about Jews, as would Chesterton, that um, would sound much worse to the mo- sound much worse to the modern ear than sounded at the time. But doesn't mean that I like them anyway. But like, you know, one of the wonderful things about people like Knock and and Chesterton um, is they knew enough about the past to recognize that a lot of new ideas were just fancy brand name switches for old notions from aristocracy to witchcraft. And, and they were about uh, empowering, you know, new generations uh, in ways uh, uh, where they didn't have to show their work. So one of the words which has apparently emerged out of this year's meeting in Davos um, is uh, gratuity included. No, is... Um, Polycrisis. Um, polycrisis apparently means many crises that feed into each other and that the globe is facing a polycrisis. And that's funny. I just, whenever I hear it, I imagine that somewhere out there, there's someone with the last name Crisis and he might have been thinking about naming or she might have been thinking about naming their daughter Polly and now they can't. You know, it's one thing if your last name is crisis, you're not going to name your kid existential, right, or extinction level, um, but you might name your kid Polly. Um, anyway, uh, this Polly crisis thing, on the one hand, I got no problem with the idea that we're facing a lot of mutually dependent and mutually impacting crises. You know, the war in Ukraine is raising food prices that is affecting places like Pakistan and Africa, a lot of countries in Africa, really deleteriously. Because something like 10%, I want to say, of global like wheat and corn, maybe a corn, um, but like a, a couple of the, the core staples of, you know, sort of bread products around the world, something like 10% comes out of Ukraine or goes, you know, through the Black Sea from Ukraine and Russia? I can't remember, but it's a huge number. And, you know, if you know about, like, a little bit about the economics of this stuff, you know, even small changes at the margins of um, supply chains or, or of supply um, can have really outside effect, a really, out, you know, outsized effects. It's sort of like I, the way I always think about it is, like, uh, at, at home in D.C., um, I live near this road, um, Canal Road, that sort of connects uh, parts of Virginia and Maryland um, to D.C., and it gets a lot of traffic on it. One of my huge uh, peeves is that um, people from D.C. who pay the taxes to maintain that road cannot get on it at rush hour to go into downtown D.C., um, because it is such an important artery for people coming from Maryland and, and from Virginia. Anyway, that my rage will be, on that point will be postponed for another day. Um, but this road has no shoulders. And so like even like a 2% above capacity level of traffic drives that thing to a standstill. Um, and if there's even the slightest accident, you know, that stops one of the lanes, um, just things get backed up. And when you take something like, you know, grain shipments out of Ukraine off the global market, um, you know, it may only be 10% in the aggregate or whatever the number is, but for some countries, it's 100% or 50% or whatever, and that's hard to make up. Anyway, so I have, I have no problem with the idea that one crisis is fueling another crisis, you know. Um, during COVID, we talked about all sorts of various things like that. That's my problem with the, this new buzzword is that it is a new buzzword for a very old, familiar and reasonable concept. Um, and to, and I can just feel it coming down the pike. People are going to say, oh, the government needs to be able to do this or the UN needs to be able to do that because this isn't just a crisis. It's a poly crisis. And, um, 
And so it's a perfect example of what I was talking about, about, you know, the problem with new ideas. A lot of the new ideas are just simply new brand names for old ideas. And um, the idea that crisis justifies um, giving the state greater power is um, one of the, it's one of the, it's one of the bedrock doctrinal points of a lot of libertarian oriented political science, but also of a lot of political science and like exploiting crisis is, you know, the essence of, of whether you want, you know, of, of fascism, but it's also the essence of every form of authoritarianism, right? This is the one of the problems you get into when you talk about, if you say, oh, this is what fascists do. It's true. But it's also what communists do. It's also what socialists do. It's also what a lot of sort of like mainstream liberal democratic politicians do when they can get away with it. It's what climate change activists do. It's what conservatives do. You know, if you if you can make something a crisis that allows you to um, bend or break the rules or suspend the rules. Um, and sometimes that's warranted, right? I mean, this is like, uh, this is my point throughout the COVID stuff is that Pandemics are one of those few things that the founders sort of anticipated um, and the politi and liberal political theory anticipates justifies um, suspending the normal rules. Um, now, it doesn't mean suspending all of them and it doesn't mean, you know, you know, dictatorship is allowed, but, you know, things like, you know, uh, you know, certain kinds of free expression, you know, if for, you know, like normally I think you have a right to wear or not wear anything you want on your face. Um, but, you know, during a pandemic, it's reasonable for the state to have, you know, an opinion on this stuff. It's better if it's done at the local level and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, my point is, is that you can make vaccines mandatory. You can do all sorts of things under the, under the logic of a, of a crisis. Now you can argue that the COVID thing, the COVID itself wasn't enough of a crisis to justify what, what some of the things that were done. And I think in some cases that's a great argument. In other cases, it's not a great argument. But we're talking about just simply in principle, let's say the bubonic plague, you know, mutated and came back strong. And we're looking at a third of the population dying. The state would be allowed to do things um, right and rightly so that it wouldn't be allowed to do during normal times. And this, this, you know, uh, go read uh, Robert Higgs's Crisis in Leviathan. You know, there's a history of this. Um, there's a reason why some of the worst legacy public policies we have were imposed during wartime, right? I mean, I think, I think, at least in some cities, rent control was imposed during, I think, World War One, and we're stuck with it. Um, the I just talked to Brian Riedel about this, about, you know, the healthcare coming from your employer thing was a World War II crisis measure. Uh, paycheck withholding was a World War II crisis measure, which, you know, Milton Friedman, when he worked in the, in the government, um, proposed it as a temporary measure and it, we still got it today. Um, and, and so when I hear people talking about poly crisis as if like, oh, this is just so different than crisis, um, I just get very nervous about it. And I think it's kind of like, um, it's a bait, it's another one of these sort of bait and switch things. Uh, okay. So I've gone about an hour. Um, I got to, uh, get going to the airport shortly. I got to get some real coffee. This, I mean, again, people, at this hotel are very nice. I like this hotel. Um, the fact that it's surrounded by some really creepy people, um, isn't necessarily their fault. <laughs> um, but I do take great offense that they don't have, you know, the practice of having coffee available very early in the morning. Um, like their coffee service doesn't set up until like 630 or 7. And um, I think that's just kind of crazy, particularly for West Coast hotels, because you get a lot of people who are still on Eastern time coming to these kinds of hotels. And, um, you know. Uh, anyway, so I've been drinking this, what is it called? Nosa Familia iced coffee. It's a can of iced coffee. It's not bad for what it is, but it's not doing what I need it to do. Um, oh, um, you know, one last thing. I, I, I don't want to sound whiny or, or, or envious of all this kind of, of this stuff. Um, 
Uh, but you know, there was this, there's this unfolding, you know, daily wire versus Steven Crowder thing that it, a lot of people in my line of work <laughs> are talking about. And, um, the gist of it is that the Daily Wire, uh, which is, you know, uh, Ben Shapiro's shop, although I don't think he's actually like, he doesn't do much of the running of it day to day anymore. It's this guy, Jeremy Boring and some other people, but very successful company. Kudos to Ben for his success and all that. Um, um, I don't particularly like a lot of their work product. Um, uh, the fact that they... Uh, pay Candace Owens to be Candace Owens, I think is shameful. Um, but anyway, they made an offer to Steven Crowder that is apparently for um, $50 million over four years. Now, apparently it, that Crowder is now saying that also includes maintaining his studio and his staff and all of that. So it's a little more plausible um, than I thought it was a couple days ago. A couple days ago, I... I thought that this is some sort of weird f fakery going on. Um, because even though I know Crowder has a lot of viewers and um, on YouTube, um, the idea that he was being paid on par with like an NFL quarterback or, or, or a Fox News primetime host, the economics of that just didn't make sense to me and still kind of don't. But if it's really a package for a bunch of other people, it's a little different. Um, at the same time, look, I think Crowder is not funny. <laughs> this idea that he's like this right wing comedian. I just don't think he's funny. I've never thought he was funny. I've always thought he was kind of embarrassing. Um, and the idea that, and he's also, I don't know what's in his heart. I do know that he says really dumb things on race and about Jews recently. Um, I wrote about this a little while ago, you know, his, um, his defense of Kanye West by just saying, really, just, you know, too stupid to be a spell checker at an m, m factory, kind of dumb crap about Jews. Um, uh, it's, anyway, he says really dumb things about a lot of stuff. Some of it, I think, is very bigoted and racist, um, or at least he, it's, it's winkingly bigoted and racist because there are viewers who like that stuff. Um, and it's just, it's depressing to me, um, you know, being the co-founder of the dispatch, which is trying very hard. And I think succeeding on our own terms, um, to be an alternative to all of that right wing, make you, it's more important to make you angry than make you smart. Um, it's more important, um, to tell you what you want to hear than to tell you what you need to hear, kind of journalism, the infotainment, um, the the conspiracy paranoia stuff about vaccines that Candace Owens does. Um, it's very depressing to me that um, there is that kind of money out, there's that kind of market out there that thinks that stuff is authentic, real, and valuable conservatism. And I'm not saying that, you know, like, I mean, Ben Shapiro is really smart and he says lots of things I agree with and I think that lot, and he writes lots of things that I agree with. And I think a lot of his stuff is, is, is insightful and perfectly mainstream conservative stuff. But as a, the place on a whole hires and promotes a lot of garbage. And, um, and the, I, and so it's funny, you know, like a lot of people are taking sides, you know, Daily Wire versus Steven Crowder and all this. And, you know, my position is, um, you know, like, yeah. Crowder is an ungracious jackass by going public with this dispute. You know, this is a guy who, um, you know, he called this offer $50 million over four years, uh, slave wages. And, um, and he's, you know, he's the kind of sort of handy wannabe who went nuts at, I don't know who's Colin Kaepernick, but some black NFL uh, quarterback who called his salary slave wages. And he, uh, you know, dare you call that slave wages, being paid millions of dollars a year. Blah, blah, blah. But when it comes to himself, he says the exact same kind of thing. And in, even if he's got a team of, of 500 people, <laughs> the idea that this is slave wages um, when it, and something to be offended by, right? He made this thing go, he went public with this thing because he was like offended by the offer. 
and this is one of the reasons why I think it is some, there's some theater here um, at work. Like this gets attention, this gets clicks. Um, this is a way to sort of humble brag. Um, um, but my main problem in this dispute is that I think it's shameful that the Daily Wire wants to hire the guy. Um, and so while I'm, I'm, I'm with the Daily Wire in thinking that Crowder is being a jackass, but I don't know why, Daily, and I know why, but I, it, it, it's unimaginable to me to want to run a company where, like, you think Crowder would be a valuable member of your stable and that, and it, and it's, it's depressing to me that the economics are such that apparently it is at least plausible. Again, I am, I'm withholding judgment until I learn more about how much I believe the public version of all of this, but there are smart people I've talked to who think it's at very, at very minimum plausible that, you know, $50 million for four years for Crowder um, makes economic sense. That bums me out, you know? Uh, when you think about how obviously sort of his, you know, as with all YouTube channel stuff, it's aimed at younger viewers and all that kind of stuff. Um, and maybe this is a reason why the dispatch needs to be more aggressive going into that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, we work really hard to do responsible, good stuff, and we want to do so much more. And yet the market and, and, and we think, you know, look, this is the reason I do the remnant, right, is that whole point about it is I think there's an actual thing that is conservatism that is of real importance for society, for civilization, for our politics, for human prosperity and human flourishing and all of these kinds of things. And it doesn't involve needlessly sort of making people um, angry. And you know, I, I did some of that needlessly making people angry stuff um, for a long time. And I didn't see the contradictions in it. And I'll take my lumps for, you know, as I say in this letter to the editor of National Review, you know, part of my, in my own head, my goal, one of my goals in writing liberal fascism was to get people to stop inappropriately using the term fascist. Um, and instead, you know, I deserve as much blame as anybody for helping to make it bipartisan. And, you know, and so on that level, you know, liberal fascism sold well, but it was, it was a failure. Um, at least on those terms. Um, but anyway, on this stuff, it's just, it is depressing to me, uh, given how hard we work, how hard we've worked to launch this thing, to keep this thing going, to um, carve out a niche um, out there. And this, this and th in many ways, this applies to National Review, which um, you know, I spent 20 years of my life at. And um, um, those kinds of dollars for that kind of schlock um, depresses me. Um, it's not that, you know, I know that there's schlock out there that makes a lot of money. I, you know, watch a lot of schlocky TV and that kind of stuff. But there's a difference between, you know, um, you know, TV shows with the, the appropriate amount of gratuitous nudity and violence Um and people claiming to speak for and define conservatism, that includes, you know, people like Candace Owens and, and Steve Crowder and, 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 you know, and Steve Bannon and all that entire, you know, phylum. And um, anyway, uh, if, you, if you agree with me even a little bit about this um, and you're not, you know, a subscriber to the dispatch, um, you know, think about that, right? We're not a charity, right? We're not asking, we're not rattling the tin cup. Um, but we're trying, one of the things we're trying to prove is that you can do this as, that this business model can work. Um, and uh, and also what support, if there are other conservative publications out there, you know, commentary is fantastic. Um, I will always and continue to love National Review. Um, support those guys too. You know, like do a little, and again, look, if you can't afford it, that's fine. These are tough times. I get it. But at the margins, um, you know, there really is a kind of, um, you know, slouching towards Bethlehem kind of feel to this where the best lack all conviction and the worst are full of passionate intensity. And, um, um, and this is just one of those signs of it. So if you can, if you can, um, 
if you can subscribe to the dispatch, that would be fantastic. If you're already subscribing to the dispatch, if you can um, persuade other people to, you know, we need some proselytizing. And if we're going to grow the way we want to continue to grow. And so with that, uh, that's as close as I will get to sort of special pleading, um, at least this week. And um, thanks, everybody, for listening. And I will talk to you later. Later.